out as Margaret. Margaret Clitheroe, you've been brought from the Castle of York to this guild hall on this, the 14th day of March in the year of grace, 1586, and you are indicted of felony for that you have harboured and maintained Jesuit and seminary priests, traitors to the Queen's Majesty and her laws, and that you have had mass said. Margaret Clitheroe, how say you? Are you guilty of this indictment or no? Woman, you should not be standing before the judges with your hat on. Take it off. I'm sorry. I, I will remove it. Now, Margaret Clitheroe, what say you to these offences? I know of no offence for which I should confess myself guilty. Woman, how will you be tried? Having made no offence, I need no trial. The law lays down that those who refuse to submit their case to a jury shall be executed with greater cruelty. You must be tried. Then I will be tried by none but by God and your own consciences. I have done no wrong. If then you will not put yourself to be tried, hear your judgment. You shall return to the place from whence you came and taken to the lowest part of the prison. There you shall be stripped naked, laid down, your back upon the ground, and as much weight laid upon you as you are able to bear, and so to continue three days without meat or drink, except a little barley bread and puddle water, and the third day be pressed to death, your hands and feet tied to posts, and a sharp stone under your back. Look to her, Master Sheriff. jailer that none is permitted to speak with me but such as are appointed by the council of the north. Margaret, I must give you a warning. A couple by the name of Yoward are going to be put in this cell to spy on you. They are being transferred from the debtor's prison. Thank you for the warning. I also wanted to help you make this cell a little more habitable. This low prison is put a little above the mud of the river Ouse. We'll put this pail underneath the drip. Better. <laughs> the whole city is in an uproar about the sentence, but the council are countering by saying you are possessed with a merry devil and seek your own death. Why did you not plead? I knew that if I should have put myself for trial by jury, evidence must needs have come against me, which I know none could give but only my children and servants. Oh, thank God I can no longer be the occasion of another's death, or bring them to sufferings. Oh, be the cause of the shipwreck of their faith. Margaret. Shh. What is it, Agnes? I thought I heard something. No. No, I must be mistaken. But you haven't told me yet how you find yourself here. I was arrested on Saturday and was accused of having been seen hearing mass in your house. Oh. I don't know how long the jailer will let me stay. You bribed him. He provides the meanest food at the most exorbitant price and denies us the very necessaries of life. Alas, the only way he has of making a living is by the money he gets out of his prisoners. Margaret, someone is coming. I brought you two cellmates, Mistress Margaret Clitheroe. I'm Mrs. Yoward. And this little fellow that's half my width and half my height is my good husband, Mr. Yabbard. How, How do you do? do? Uh, which one of you is Mrs. Clitheroe? I am. My wife and I were informed you not to have any visitors, Margaret Clitheroe. Now, husband, come off your eye horse. Mm. This lady's time is short enough. We are the likes of us, Papa, you know. We are not of the old faith, Mrs. Clitheroe. We accept the new established church as ordered by Queen and Parliament. I think, in fairness, I must make this clear. Thank you for telling me, Mrs. Yoward. I'm a woman who speaks her mind. Which makes two of us, Mrs. Yoward? You pluck, young lady. That my pluck. Well, me and Mr. Yoward leave you now to your business with your friend, and we'll try to keep out of your way, unless you want us for anything. Well, that's very kind of you, Mrs. Yoward. Well, come on now, husband. Let's make this new roof over our heads a little like a home. I 
madness. How long do you think I have to live? The talk is they want you dead within the week. Oh, I knew they saw my blood, but I didn't think they sought it so swiftly. Agnes, I crave your prayers that I might persevere. You know you have them, Margaret. I want you also to get word out to Father Mush, desiring him to pray earnestly for me. I'll see that it is done. Agnes, God sent you here to my side. Your well, company has always brought me cheer. But I want to take advantage of these fleeting moments. You know, Agnes, I see a pattern in my life. It's as if someone on high has taken me by the hand and, and led me on a marvellous journey, clearly laid out and signposted. I want to go back with you over this wondrous journey. I would have been about ten years old. There was a torchlight procession approaching the marketplace. First came a cart and a horse, and then the sheriff and the officers of the archbishop. They were escorting a shrunken, sullen-faced man, carrying a pile of leather volumes. Behind him were other officers carrying beautiful mass vestments. The sheriff climbed onto a cart, while two men with torches set light to a brazier full of faggots. Take my eyes off the sullen-faced man. The flickering flames etched deeper into his face. He held up his hands in supplication towards the sheriff. No more, sheriff. I've sold him a soul. What more do you want of me? What you have sold in private, you must repeat in public. And then everybody knows. Afterwards, you're a free man. Free? To wonder a man branded as a traitor to all he once held dear. Now you pull yourself together. It'll soon be over. Citizens of York, gather round. Come and see what we have here. Not too close, not too close. Spread out now so that you can all see. <laughs> as you all know, or all should know, by Acts of Parliament, the supremacy of the Church in England has been restored to the Crown. Which means that in matters pertaining to religious practice, we do what Her Majesty the Queen of England, our gracious Elizabeth, lays down for our benefit. Why, when did she become a bishop? <laughs> did I hear treason spoken? Under the guidance of our gracious Queen Elizabeth, we have the second book of common prayer to guide us in our worship. The mass is abolished. No one can abolish the mass. Christ himself instituted it at the Last Supper. The Queen and Parliament have decreed that saying mass and hearing mass is no longer lawful. The bishops who have refused to accept this fact and who have not taken the oath of supremacy upholding the Queen to be head of the church in England have been deprived of their sees and arrested. The clergy who have not obeyed their instructions to tear down altars and rude lofts and destroy vestments, bells, censers, crosses, candlesticks, holy water stoops, statues and service books of the old faith are now coming under the scrutiny of the commissioners for causes ecclesiastical. This prisoner is one of them. Bring him forward. Look at the wretch. His name is Edward Reeks and he was a priest in Barrowbridge. He thought he knew better than Queen and Parliament and concealed in his house forbidden books. Now, Edward Reeks, by the wisdom of the commissioners, has been condemned to a practical form of penance which will serve to instruct at the same time you who are still steeped in ignorance and superstition. Go about your business, disobedient priest. Destroy the books. Oh. It's a beautiful illuminated missile for saying mass. This is what we do with all useless articles of popery, superstition. Burn them. Sacrilege. Stop it, Father. Don't do it. He'll do what he's told, woman. Don't go away, ladies. We're coming to the most interesting parts. 
Bargains for you all. Now, look at these fine cloths. Vestments. Chasubos made of the finest silk, satin and velvet. Look at the craftsmanship, ladies. Ladies, you're not going to pass up such good bargains for old superstitious fears. Superstition, is it? The mass has been said since the apostles. Why should it be wrong now? Are you questioning the Queen and Parliament? Can even queens change the laws of God? Arrest that woman! She's talking treason! Come on, Come on. Let me be! Oh, Father, you can't do this. Reading from those holy books, wearing those vestments, you have served our Lord's designs, lending him your body and your voice. In persona et in nomine, Christi. What is that you said in Latin, Reeks? I was summing up what she said and what used to be the teaching. And what does it mean? In the name of Christ, in the person of Christ. Look at him, look at this miserable wretch, and ask yourself if he could ever stand in the name of Christ, in the person of Christ. <laughs> You'd better lend yourself to this, Reeks. Here's a knife. Please, Father... No more sacrilege. Take that woman away. <laughs> Come on, Don't away. do it, Father. Cut out all the linings and the interlinings so that we can sell the stuff for dresses for wives or coverlets for beds. You'll be back where you started if you don't. Well, Reeks, have you had enough? Do you want to go back for more? <laughs> Make the cuts, Reeks. Go on, cut the vestments. Cut, Reeks, or there'll be other punishments. <gasps> Again, Reeks. <sighs> and what have you to say as you rend them? Don't forget the words, Reeks. The mass is abolished in England. The mass is abolished. The sheriff and the officers threw water on the brazier to put it out. It all seemed so harsh and destructive. I remember sitting by my father's bed just before he died and asking him why those beautiful things had been destroyed. He was a sheriff of York too. I'll try to answer for both our sakes as honestly as I can. It means going back to the days of the Queen's father, Henry VIII. Mm. Henry wanted to divorce his wife, Queen Catherine, but the Pope refused. So he broke with Rome and made himself head of the church within his realm. He believed in the mass and the old religion, but he didn't accept the Pope as head anymore. Then who abolished the mass? His son, Edward. But why? Politics. This are above the understanding of the likes of us. So you men would have your women folk believe, Father? Ah, if you want an explanation, think of the new religion as a middle road. What if the middle road leads to the wrong place? Look, Margaret, I saw Robert Ask lead a pilgrimage of grace in King Henry's time... And I remember his rotting corpse hanging in chains from the castle tower. But where do your sympathies lie, Father? Uh, how can a wax chandler like me become enthusiastic for a new religion that does away with the burning of candles? <laughs> you make light of the question, Father. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've a ready wit, Margaret. And God's given you a comely face and beauty correspondent. But be careful what you say touching matters of religion. These are dangerous times. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have liked nothing better than to endow a chantry so masses could be said for the repose of my soul. Mm -hmm. I, w I want you to promise, Margaret... Yes, Father. ...that if the time comes when masses... Once more said in England, you'll have masses said for me. I will, Father. I will. 
I want, I want to rest now. <clears throat> is, is, is that your mother I hear? It is, good husband, it is. Both of you sit with me for a while. Oh, you look tired, Thomas, dear. I, I, I'd like the vicar, Thomas Grayson, to pay me a visit this night. Thomas Grayson? I hear that he may soon be in trouble for keeping Catholic books with a friend in the country. Well, not him. That's why I want him. Tell him I'm in need of the last rites of the old faith. Uh, if I'm to depart this world, I'll go anointed as my father and his father before him. I'll have no new rites concocted by hedge priests and the queen's ministers and light candles for my extreme unction. My father died shortly afterwards. The church seemed cold and empty, stripped of all its altars. No requiem was allowed. But as the solemn procession left the church, the choir broke into the plain chant of the old, forbidden Dies Irae. Dies Irae, Dies Illo. There seemed a link with all the previous centuries as the notes echoed round the ancient church walls, filling in the gaps in time and directing minds to first beginnings. It filled my mind still as the will was read. I, Thomas Middleton, wax chandler of this parish, and a sheriff of York, leave to each of the four wards of the city three shillings and four pence for the poor, and ask them to pray for me. To my youngest daughter, Margaret, I leave one silver goblet and half a dozen spoons. To her goes the right of inheritance of the house in Davygate, York, after the death of my wife, Jane, her mother. Pray for me. your father, Thomas Middleton, Mrs. Clitheroe. A fine man he was. Yes. Though your mother wasn't very long away there, was she? I knew Lord Mayor Henry May soon sort of that. Your mother's money took Henry May from the beggar's staff and provided the means of advancement, I'll be bound. I want you to meet your new father, Margaret, Mr. Henry May. <laughs> Father has been dead only four months, Mother. We need a man about the house. I need a husband, you a father. And I promise you I'll treat you like my very own flesh and blood, young lady. Mr May is a very fine man, Margaret. He'll look after both of us. I didn't like the way he looked at me. And I always felt uncomfortable when he was near me. I was so happy when I was 17 and my marriage was arranged... And I was able to get away from my innkeeper stepfather. I may be some years older than you, Margaret, but I promise I'll be a good husband to you. 
And I a good wife to you, John Clitheroe. Oh, you're a merry lass. <laughs> and I'll see you have a happy life. We'll go to banquets and feasts where wives are shown the greatest honour. And where we can renew neighbourly love and friendship. Good food, good wine, good company. And we'll all be merry together, eh? <laughs> <laughs> like the guests at our wedding. Aye. Listen to them. And you'll be the prettiest, wittiest, comeliest of them all. I will try to be a good wife. I know that as a purveyor of meat, you have to travel often. Aye. And when I'm travelling in rain and wind, snow and hail, sometimes drenched, sometimes sweating, I'll think of my good wife and the ease and the joys and the pleasures you'll do me on my return. If it's cold, I'll have a good fire where your shoes will be removed, your feet washed and have fresh shoes and stockings. And then you'll sit down, Aye. be given good food and wine <laughs> and be well served and well looked after. And finally, I'll see you well bedded in white sheets and nightcap. <sighs> Methinks, as my mother has told me, such service maketh a man to love and desire to return to his home and see his good wife and be distant with other women. And methinks this marriage has indeed been made in heaven, even though it was arranged and I've not sung the warful ballads and sighed like a furnace. Oh, I've looked forward to becoming a wife and have need of neither sighs nor ballads. <laughs> I have vowed to love, cherish and obey you, John Clitheroe, and that I will in that same order. <laughs> Well, the Lord certainly blessed your union and made you a plentiful mother in children, Margaret. God be thanked. He's been so good to me. I remember the firstborn as if it were yesterday. Oh, I'm so happy, Mother, oh, so happy. He's wonderful. And so are you, Margaret. Do you know, Henry, she's taken over the care and education of my first wife's children. She's taken charge of the shop downstairs and she manages to keep a sharp eye on the servants and apprentices. <laughs> I commit all to her trust and discretion. And on top of it all, she's provided me with another son. <laughs> I think it calls for a celebration, Henry. Let's have some wine. So be it, John. <clears throat> John loves company, Mother. I have never been to so many parties and banquets. I am happy for you both. He's opening his eyes. Oh, Henry Clitheroe, what will life have in store for you, I wonder? Uh, you'll all be uh, attending the execution at the pavement, I trust. Oh. Execution? Uh, being in childbirth, you must have missed the news. Oh. Thomas Percy, Earl of Northumberland, has been publicly executed as one of the leaders of the rebellion of three years ago. I thought he had fled to Scotland. <laughs> he had, but he was purchased from the Scots for the sum of £2,000. But when was his trial? Well, none was needed. He'd been condemned by active attainder. Ballads both sides of the border cursed both buyers and sellers. I doubt the wisdom of this public spectacle in the marketplace. <laughs> he won't die. He'll recant. Pity, though. An execution's good for business. What's the thirst? Henry, the Earl is much loved by many people. Aye, yeah, by papists. He tried to help that papist whore, Mary Queen of Scots, escape. <sighs> if it had anything to do with me, I wouldn't give him any choice but the headsman's axe. What choice will he have? If he agrees publicly to conform, he'll be set at liberty. There's nothing like the beheading of an Earl to bring out the crowd. Oh, I bet we're doing a roaring trade back at the inn. We really should be there now. Thomas Percy, Earl of Northumberland, you are condemned to be beheaded for the heinous crime of treason. But before this vast multitude who have come to see you die, I am empowered to offer you life and liberty on certain conditions. But you must renounce the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church and agree to be an obedient servant of Her Majesty and from henceforward attend the services of the new authorised religion of this realm. Do you, Thomas Percy, Earl of Northumberland, accept Her Gracious Majesty's clemency, renounce the Pope, and agree to go to the new services as laid down by Queen and Parliament? No, I cannot. 
I must stand by that church which, throughout the whole Christian world, is knit and bound together under one universal head. In this same faith, I'm about to end this unhappy life. But as for this new English church, I do not acknowledge it. You are dying an obstinate papist, a member not of the Catholic, but of the Roman Church. Yeah. That which you call the Roman Church is the Catholic Church, which has been founded on the teachings of the Apostles. Jesus Christ himself being its cornerstone, strengthened by the blood of martyrs, honoured by the recognition of the early fathers. And it continues always the same, being the church against which, as Christ our Saviour said, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Now, before my death, I beg all present to forgive me, and I declare that I... For my part, forgive all from my heart. He knelt down and remained a few moments in silent prayer. Then he made the sign of the cross and folded his arms in the form of a cross on his chest. Laying his head upon the block, he prayed again. The executioner raised his axe. Lord, receive my soul. O oh God, receive his soul into eternal rest. O oh God, I was becoming aware that the old Catholic faith was the faith of our fathers, and had been since the world was first delivered from idolatry and paganism. I was also finding no substance nor comfort in the ministers of the new gospel. So I carefully employed myself to know about this heritage and become a member of the true church. In those days, the fury of the persecution was only just beginning, Catholic times being fresh in the memory of all. I remember the first time I saw the chief divisor and contriver of our troubles, Henry Hastings, Earl of Huntingdon, Lord President of the North. It was shortly after his appointment when he invited the leading citizens to meet him. There was to be a banquet with the Lord Mayor afterwards. John and I were invited, and so was my stepfather, Henry May. The Lord President swept in, acknowledging no one, and began immediately to address us all. My Lord Mayor, aldermen and prominent citizens of York, as a cousin of Her Glorious Majesty the Queen and the new President of the Council in these parts... I bring you her greetings and a special message. By former commissions, the Queen's Council within your divisions commanded you to certify what persons, misliking the doctrine now taught and the religion now established, do absent themselves from the new services. In the execution of this, some of you have been remiss, careless and negligent. We therefore charge and command you that before the 15th day of December next, you do provide the names, qualities and degrees of every such person who absents himself or herself from the new services, whether he be knight, justice of the peace, squire, gentleman, freeholder or other. Fail you not in the diligent execution of this, for you will answer the contrary at your peril, given under our signet the 27th day of October, the 16th year of our reign. <coughs> You look taken aback by the message, my Lord Mayor of York. We feel rebuked, Lord President. Rebuked, Lord Mayor? You should feel more than rebuked for your past indolence and indifference to the orders of Her Majesty and Council. You should feel threatened. Threatened? Threatened. Then you will know how to pass the fear in your stomach on to these recusants. Lord President, we have already jailed many of them. But for how long? Have you exercised the powers you have to keep them in prison for life, if necessary? That is clear you have not. Well, gentlemen, we will lose no time initiating a campaign against recusants. You, the corporation, will compel church wardens to report to you, along with parish constables and other discreet and honest persons of every parish. Your parish committees will also certify the names of all who are fugitives and fled out of the realm for religion or any other cause or notorious crime, and of such as do lurk and be kept secret in any house, town or other place, and in whose houses they be so kept and maintained. 
The said malefactors are to be apprehended and brought in safe custody to the council. Do you understand? I do not hear you. Gentlemen, from your lips must come the words, we understand and we will carry out your instructions, Lord President. Then be about your business, Mayor and Corporation of York. Hunt down these papists in our midst. Worried men bowed their heads in silence as he stormed out. My husband and my stepfather couldn't get him out of their minds, even at the banquet. He beareth the very countenance of a tyrant. He has much power. He's also a kinsman of the Queen, John. Should any man have the power and influence to make us into common informers against our neighbours? Be careful what you say, John. You come from a baby's family. And don't we all, Henry? John, be quiet for both our sakes. You cannot say such things with impunity in so public a place. Especially when we will be among those discreet and honest persons who make these inquiries. Nay, yeah, not me, Henry. Nearly all the butchers' wives in York remain loyal to the old church. Our recusants and papists, you mean. Mm. John, all here will be expected to take part in the Earl's campaign against the papists. If you don't, you'll be immediately suspect. And your chances of attaining any further offices in the corporation will be negligible. You must be on the committees. It would be only a token gesture. Token gesture? They're all that are wanted. You must show openly your for the council. Now... Let's give them the lip service they require. <clears throat> uh, you have here <clears throat> two who will hunt down these infamous papists, my Lord Mayor. I, Henry May, am my friend and relation by marriage, John Clitheroe. There you have a man who speaks for England. I think we've just taken a most judicious step towards where power, preference and influence lie in this city. You have, Henry. You have. I still hesitate. John, your own brother William is a priest. How can you join those bent on persecuting him? I won't persecute anyone. But you volunteered. And one of your duties will be taking names and reporting anyone who does not attend the new services. Better me doing it than anyone else. I shall be a very poor informer, Margaret. You'll also be a very poor Catholic while you're working for the Lord President. This is a time of storm, Margaret, and while this storm rages, I don't see how anyone can continue to be a Catholic. Not with the fines, forfeiture of goods, and finally imprisonment for life for those who persist. No. We'll yield, we'll bend to this storm, until that storm is overpassed. Oh, John, you're so lukewarm, you're so confused. Storms are nothing new. Civil authority crucified Peter, the first bishop of Rome. He didn't bend to the storm. The early Christians were thrown to the lions. They didn't run away or bend to the storm either. We have to stand up and face the fury of this present storm. You're asking me to risk losing everything. Yes, to gain everlasting happiness. We have to be practical. But, but I am practical. I look after the shop, the house, and all the daily chores. I see to the children. In the thousand and one affairs of each day, I am practical. Yes, I admit you are practical in all these things. Oh, John, I am also practical in my desire to get to heaven and to take with me all those I love the dearest. Riches I desire none. For we have already too much. You yourself, John, cannot lift up your head to God for the weight of your worldly goods. Oh. And trying to talk with you about spiritual matters is like, oh, wrestling with the wind. So I tried to remain constant while John tried to bury his conscience. But he always quietly supported me. In some ways he suffered more than I did. As for me, my many periods of imprisonment proved to be a most happy and profitable school, where I learned to read both English and Latin, and to develop commodiously the Christian virtues. They persecuted me, and I thereby learned patience. They shut me up into closed prison, and I thereby learned to forget and despise the world. They separated me from house, children and husband, and I thereby became familiar with God. Oh, but the joy of returning home to John and the children. How I missed them. 
To Margaret. To a life of happiness and fulfilment. We'll all drink to that. Aye, Aye, Margaret. Margaret. I thank you all from the bottom of my heart, especially my good husband, John. And his friends, Thomas Fisher and Thomas Temple, here present for pledging themselves for the bond for my release. Thank you. It's wonderful to have you home again, Margaret. Nothing's been the same without you. All right, Lucy. What a good husband I found for you, Margaret, eh? <clears throat> he pays your fines, he suffers your absences, he goes before courts and councils on your behalf, and he still <clears throat> thinks you're the best wife in the world. <laughs> she is. No, oh, when she's here. <laughs> I couldn't put up with an empty marriage bed like you do, John. You've shown you can't put up with an empty bed, Henry. It's hardly been empty since Margaret's mother passed on. Oh, are you referring to the two serving wenches who provided me with certain comforts and consolations during the lonely days following my sad bereavement, Agnes? Well, I... Uh... Yeah, see? You're embarrassed. I'm not. Gossip doesn't worry me. Oh, in these days, in the circles I move in, it would do me more harm for them to know I've been dining with papists like yourselves than sleeping with my serving wenches. Henry. Eh? <laughs> and for your information, one of those serving wenches, Anne Thompson, I intend to make an honourable woman of and marry her. Huh? <laughs> Aye. Now, who's going to propose a toast to my intended nuptials? I hope you will be very happy, Father. Thank you, Margaret. I'm glad you're concerned for my happiness. It's a pity your husband didn't follow my path. Your path wasn't mine, Henry. I will agree to the pity, John Clitheroe. Oh, you too might be now within reach of the highest office of this city. The office of Lord Mayor? Yes, the office of Lord Mayor. Yes, I'd heard rumours, but has the Earl of Huntington approved of you? Oh, why shouldn't he? The Lord President of the Council of the North and me are good friends. My readiness to apply the laws against recusants, unlike many important men of this city, brought me to his notice, as I knew it would. Aye. And, uh, though I had to prove that despite a stepdaughter I'd brought up properly in the new religion, and who, because of evil influences, had returned to the superstitions of Rome, that I myself was a man to be relied upon. So I organised raids and made many arrests, though I was able to turn a blind eye in, uh, in certain cases. Oh, yes, the Earl of Huntingdon, Lord President of the Council in the North, a kinsman of our great, gracious Queen, is backing Henry May. <laughs> in other words, you're looking at the next Lord Mayor of York. Now, let's drink to that. Oh, come on. What are you waiting for? Oh, I know you're going to give me that. What doth it profit a man if? If what? I'm not interested. If he gained the old world and suffered the loss of his own soul. No, I'm still not interested. I'd gain the world if I could. Aye, I'd hold it all in my hands today. Give me it. Now. The world, the flesh, the power. I'll take me chance with eternity. You're a bigger fool than I thought, Henry. Fool? I'll show you who's a fool. I'll hunt down all papists and traitors, and you, stepdaughter Margaret Clitheroe, in my year of office, are going to conform. I'll see to it. Even if your husband there's too soft and blind to it, your stepfather Henry May isn't. Aye. I'm leaving. Now remember... Here in mass is treason and a hanging offence. And which of you here, apart from John, doesn't hear mass? Eh? Mark my words. All offenders will be brought to justice. Every one of you will either end up rotting in prison or dancing from the end of the gallows. Sleep on that, a lot of you! I'll be hanged if they'll stop me hearing mass. I <laughs> <laughs> see prison has not deprived you of your sense of humour. No, prison provided me with time for meditation. Before I left prison, I made two resolutions. Speak not of them openly, Margaret. What we do not know, we cannot be forced to utter. Then one I will tell you, because it concerns you, and one I will keep in the innermost corner of my soul. As there is no mass centre in these parts of York, I intend to have a secret place constructed, and mass said in this very house. I 
was told he wanted to see me. Yes, Father John. Now that I am temporarily delivered from prison, I have straight away set about to provide places for Mass. Places? More than one? Two places. One is to be a secret chamber in the roof adjoining this house, where I might go at any time without being seen by watchers or informers. I am hoping I will be able to go to Mass each day with my children and others. And the second place? It will be some distance from here, but it will only be known to those who are faithful and discreet, so that Mass can be said there when it is no longer safe to be said here. It will also require two lots of vestments, chalices, plates. Oh, they will all be plentifully provided for both places. Margaret, but you do know the new penalties. Yes, but I am not afraid to have Mass said and do well. This is a time of war and trial in God's church. And if I cannot do my duty without peril and dangers, then by God's grace I will not be slacker because of them. If God's priests dare venture themselves to my house, I will never refuse them. John, you are making an early start. I am ready and my horse is impatient to be on its way. Oh, must you go? I must, my love. I've been neglecting so much of late. It's many months since I visited the estate at Cornbrook. I'll be back within the week, but Margaret... Yes, John? Don't venture away from the house at any time. If you're outside on your own, they are bound to arrest you. Promise me to be most careful in all that you do. I promise you. Above all, promise me this. That you won't go out and take part in... in certain practices... You mean, go out to Mass? Margaret! They have informers everywhere. And if the authorities here whispers that we have been even discussing this practice, it's enough to bring a raid upon my house. So please, Margaret, do not go out to Mass. I promise you, John, while you are away, I will not go out of the house to Mass. Qui pridie quam paterator, the day before he suffered, in took bread into his holy and venerable hands, and with his eyes lifted up towards heaven, giving thanks to thee, God, his Father Almighty. Benedicit, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat ye all this, for this. Is my body. It was a joyous time, Agnes. I was able to attend daily mass and I found the sure, safe way. What way is that, Margaret? Finding a good priest to be my spiritual director and then being obedient to his advice. The path becomes so clearly defined, so easy to follow. Father John, I feel there is something wrong in me that I should amend. My spiritual efforts seem little or nothing. On the contrary, Margaret, you're progressing well. Oh, don't say that, Father. I know how unworthy I am in the sight of the Lord. Tell me what faults I must overcome. Well, let us go over your plan of life and see how it's working out then. Starting in the morning? Every morning I I make my morning offering and kneel in prayer one hour and a half, meditating upon the passion of Christ. And I talk to him about himself and myself, what help I can give to my persecuted and imprisoned brothers and sisters, Words I can say that will bring waverers closer to him and pass on my inner joy and tranquillity in the midst of these troubled times. You do well, and after your prayer and meditation you hear Mass. Thanks to you priests who courageously continue to offer the Mass. I pray each day for all God's priests, especially you, my spiritual director. And how I need your prayers, Margaret, how we all need them. But tell me... Why at Mass do you usually choose the place next to the door to kneel, behind all the rest? Because they're the worst and base seats, and it is the most unseemly corner in all the chamber. Ah, I see. But I commit everything to your guiding direction, Father. No prayer seems sweet, no time convenient. 
no orders straight unless I have first agreed them with you in my twice-weekly confession. That also is very good, Margaret. One's own spirit is a bad adviser, a poor guide to lead one through hostile, parched lands and dangerous paths of the interior life. Do you think I should not kneel in my accustomed place, Father? No. It is a good, small mortification to choose the worst for oneself. But it might also be good to vary it, if only to avoid routine. I remember that, Father. My most delight is to kneel anywhere where I might continually behold the Blessed Sacrament. Very good, Margaret. An aftermass? I try not to begin anything in the house without first offering it up to him, desiring that I might do his blessed will thereby, and it be for his glory and honour. But I find it so difficult, Father, in the many diverse affairs of each day, to keep this good intention in every particular action. Rome wasn't built in a day, Margaret. It is only by practising doing good, then by more practice, that virtue is acquired. Our little failures and defeats won't matter so long as we persevere in our interior struggle. Ah, uh, remember what you say, and try not to be so disheartened by my failings. Good. But then I don't get to my evening prayer until four o'clock. Then I pray with my children about me, and I finish the day with prayer and a good examination of conscience. And your spiritual reading? The New Testament, Reims translation, Kempis following of Christ. Again, I owe my ability to read to my time in prison. And I have now learned Our Lady's Matins in Latin. You progress well. You're fasting. The first lump. We fasted four times a week, partly for lack of necessary victual. The same abstinence I try to slack not now that I am delivered from prison. Now as then, I abstain from meat and have but one meal on Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Saturday. On Friday, I use the discipline when permission is given. This week, Margaret, concentrate on keeping the presence of God and meditate on how more loving and generous he is than any human father. Talk to him as a loving daughter talks to her father. Oh, that meditation will bring me great pleasure. And now I must needs be about my household duties. And Margaret, as well as your rye bread, milk and pottage, take some meat Tuesdays and Thursdays. Oh. With you, Margaret, it is more necessary to use the bridle than the spur. Very well, father. But may I carve the better piece for others and please myself with the worst? Yes, but take some meat. And say an Ave Maria before I move my hand to anything upon the table. Yes, say your Ave Marias and your rosaries. And Margaret. Yes, Father. Pray for me. Was it on Father Mushy's advice that you sent your eldest son, Henry, abroad, Margaret? No, that was the other resolution I'd made in prison. Though I did discuss the matter with Father Mush. I remember well the day I broke the news to the boy. We were coming from the mass chamber and we were closing the secret entrance in our part of the house. Anne was also with us. It must be one of the best hiding holes in the country, Mother. It was constructed by a very holy craftsman who so cleverly conceals his secret places that pursuivants have never found them. They'll never find ours, Mother, if they search for years. But we mustn't breathe a word to anyone about our hidey hole. So many lives may depend on it. We won't, Mother. And while we're alone, I have something to say that is for your ears only. You know that at any time... I could be arrested and returned to prison. I fear not for myself, but only for what may happen to my family. Well, have no fear for me. You are both so young and so sturdy. Though I am just a little frightened. Well, so are we all, Henry, but we mustn't show it. There's a resolution which I made while I was in prison, and it concerns you, Henry. In what way? If I am returned to prison, they could have you taken away. I feel there is only one safe way. What is that? For you to leave the country and go across the sea to Douai. There you can have a virtuous education and find true knowledge that will allow you, after diligent work and study, to withstand any adversity. Then I could become a priest. Only if you had a vocation. But you would be pleased if I became a priest, wouldn't you, Mother? Oh, I think it is the highest of callings. The physician may heal the body, but the priest heals and gives joy to the inner soul. 
But don't become a priest because you think I would like to see you as a priest. Only if you know God wants it so. How will I know that? You will. You will. How did you make up your mind, Mother? I secretly took instruction, and the way seemed clear and well marked. And since then, I have employed myself to know well the ancient faith and become a lively member. <laughs> a lively member you have indeed become, Mother. <laughs> <laughs> Happiness is doing what our Maker wants. Then I too will do my best. Even if it means leaving my home and you, Mother, to go abroad. Good boy. When will it be? It must needs be done in all haste, Henry, without a backward glance even. Without waiting for the morrow. Today? Today. But what about Father? You must go without his blessings or farewell. If he knows nothing until you have departed, he cannot be held responsible. But how will you break the news to him? Oh, leave that to me, Henry. You yourself face a hazardous journey. Your escape abroad will be set in motion at once. You will journey from friend's house to friend's house until you reach the coast where a passage can then be arranged. But always be on your guard. All strangers and travellers are marked men and looked upon with suspicion. And checks are made at every town and city gate. All I ask for is your blessing, Mother. And I know all will go well. May God be with you on this journey. And remain with you both on your journeys through life. Amen. Amen. Having to tell John was one of the most difficult things I had to face. I prayed so hard for the right words. Perhaps my mind was so concerned with that problem that I was careless about letting the school children see the priest's hole. Oh, yes, the school. They hunt schools with almost the same vigour as mass centres. Mm. And yet you managed to start a school in your house. Oh, I had to find tuition for my children and the children round about. It also happened at that time that the schoolmaster, Mr Stapleton, escaped from the castle where he'd lain seven years in prison for his faith. So I gave him refuge, and he taught all my children and others beside. I know that Christ appointed St Peter to be the head of the church, because Christ said to him, Thou art Peter. And, and this, young, is the room that leads to the secret mass chamber in the next house. Do you want to look inside? Yeah, please. Mother. Anne? Oh, I didn't know you were here. Jan is a new boy at the school, and I'm showing him the house. His mother is Dutch, but his father's English. Yes, I know. I hope you're happy here, Jan. Thank you, Mum. But now you must hurry back to your class. I can hear them at work. Can't I show Jan the mass chamber first? No, your class comes first. Very well, Mother. Come on, Jan. Yeah. The Church of Christ has four marks by which we may know her. She is one... She is holy. She is Catholic. She is apostolic. It all happened so quickly. Perhaps I should have restricted them to only certain parts of the house. You must not blame yourself for this fateful view of the secret entrance. Oh. As you said, your mind was on another problem at the time. John's return. I was filled with doubt and disquiet. Father Mush was away and I had no one to turn to for guidance. With feminine guile, I made John his favourite pies and whined and dined him like a king before I broke the news. You don't know how much I was looking forward to your pies, Margaret. <laughs> Nobody in the whole North Country can bake pies like you. Is that all you missed me for, with pies? You'll never know how much I did miss you. You're the best wife any man could have. <laughs> More wine? Yes. Fill it up <laughs> and have some yourself. A little... John, mm -hmm. you know I'd like our children brought up in the faith. Margaret, I pay your fines. I arrange for your release from prison on bond. I answer for your recusancy. I never even ask you how much you spend on food and relief for your friends in prison and for the sick and the destitute. I let you have your way. But if here and now in this country we didn't bring up our children as the state requires... We lose everything, and both end up in jail. Yes, uh, for once I agree with what you say. If we tried to bring them up as I wished, we would both end up in jail. At last you see the reasonableness of my arguments. So I decided, even while I was in prison, there was only one thing to do. Eh? Do what? Do as I have done with Henry while you were away. 
What have you done with Henry while I was away? I did it while you were away so that you could not be implicated. What have you done? What have you done, woman? Do not shout at me, John. What have you done? I have sent Henry abroad to Dewey. To Dewey? To that seminary? Yes. When we're ruined, they're bound to discover he's missing. Don't you realise what you've done? How furious the authorities will be. Oh, and me a chamberlain of this city. John. John, I love you and my family with all my heart. I did what I thought was right. When you married me, do you remember your promise? Yes. You vowed to love, cherish and obey me. That I have. And I do love you greatly. I do cherish you. And I obey you in all that is not against my conscience. John, those who decided to yield for a while and bend to the storm... They now seem lost to the faith and their children along with them. Oh, Margaret. Use your eyes. Look around this city where 40 years ago everyone was Catholic and every morning in every church mass began the day where people walked round the streets praying the rosary. Where are they now? Vanished. I have looked and I'm sorrowed by what I see. But I will not desert and leave the small beleaguered fortress in this land with one less defender. Even some priests would agree with me. If you asked them, they would say, let me die. I'm not worth endangering your life and your families. Don't give me refuge. I have never met one. Oh. But if I did, I would reply, I'm not risking my life for you, Father, but for your priesthood. And so you would endanger us all. Oh. Would you not do better looking after your family at home than your soul in prison? Where does your duty lie? What do your vows mean? Take these things to your prayers, Margaret. John! Lord, Lord, I am assailed with conflicts and doubts. Must I no longer continue having the Mass celebrated here? Did you not ordain that this continuance of your last supper go on to the end of time? Am I neglecting a wife's and a mother's duty by going to prison? Is it mere selfishness? Lord, Lord, give me guidance and light. Here I am, Lord, to do your will. But what is your will? Cheers you, cheers you, cheers you. May your light shine forth. May your mother Mary show me the true way. Sancta Maria, ora pro nobis. Sancta Dea Genitrix, ora pro nobis. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. It was such a relief when Father Mush, my ghostly father, returned. It is for your husband John's own safety not to know these things, unless he himself is resolved to live as a Catholic and face up to the dangers. Mm. And as for doing these things without his consent, I would say this. In doing your necessary duty to God, you are no whit inferior to him. Neither do the cruelties of wicked laws change anything. If it were lawful and a good deed before these statutes to have mass celebrated and to receive his priests, the same is still lawful and well done, yea, and even more meritorious in God's sight than ever it was. So my doubts vanished, and my resolutions were firm and clear. Yet in that same moment of joyous happiness, something told me that soon I might have to prepare my neck for the rope. Ah, Strange how thoughts run together, Agnes. I just then saw another neck, my stepfather's. Round it he was wearing the chain of office of the Lord Mayor of York. He was going to a banquet, where he was to meet none other than the Lord President of the Council of the North himself, the Earl of Huntingdon. As the new Lord Mayor... May I say how honoured I am to have the Lord President of the North at my celebration inauguration. And it is my pleasure to inform you, Your Grace, 
that we, the corporation, are sending you a ton of Gascony wine as just a small token of our appreciation. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. <laughs> now, let the music commence. There are one or two things I would like to draw to your attention, Lord Mayor, if I can have a few moments of your time. Well, of course you can, Your Grace. Uh, how, uh, how can I be of assistance? I am still concerned about recusancy in this city. Oh, by my actions in the past, I hope I've proved that I do share your concern, Your Grace. You have shown a certain amount of zeal, and I hope the council of this city, under your leadership, will act with even more determination and urgency now. I am informed that some members of the council and their families even do not give that example of coming to church that they ought to. Oh, your grace knows all that will change now. I hope so, Lord Mayor. Surely there's no doubt about my loyalty. Of course not, or you would not have been elected. My information is that those who are in these matters most peevish are the women of this place. Uh, <laughs> that is indeed so, Your Grace. In one parish alone, I am reliably informed, there are 15 recusant wives of tradesmen, seven of them wives of butchers. Oh, I would think those figures correct. One in particular is constantly mentioned in reports, a butcher's wife. Oh? One, Margaret Clitheroe, your stepdaughter, I believe, Lord Mayor. Yeah. A great thorn in my side, Your Grace. A great thorn in all our sides. She misses no opportunity, my spies tell me, to spread the evil, pernicious doctrine in the street, in the market, in her shop, at banquets even. As a result, she has perverted many from the Queen's religion. Well, Your Grace must also know that it is more than 15 years since she left my household and control. I do, I do. And uh, she has found no favour from me. She's been jailed three times and is now under house arrest. But you did not bring about the arrests. No. Again, I confess I did not. Your late wife, being Margaret Clitheroe's mother, would present difficulties. Even the highest families at court have these troublesome relations. Even I have. Uh, I'm grateful for your grace's understanding in this matter. My wife died last year. It'll now be less difficult to take harsher measures. I'm glad to hear of your new resolve, Lord Mary. <laughs> Are you, Lord Mayor, not the godfather of her eldest son, Henry? That is so. Huh. It is a fact that everyone knows, and I've never failed to publicly confess. How is your godchild? Or should I say, where is your godchild? Well, you do not answer, Lord Mayor. My intelligence has told me the boy has disappeared from the city of York and is now more likely than not overseas. As his godfather, you must have known of his disappearance. The secret could not have been kept long from you. Well, I learned of it only after he had disappeared, Your Grace. But you did not report it. Well, I felt it was then too late. I suppose you were afraid that such information might have prejudiced your chances of becoming Lord Mayor. <laughs> I don't know, Your Grace, but, but I assure you that in the future I will prove my unswerving loyalty. Well, let me advise you on how you can convince me of your loyalty. Oh, how, Your Grace? By bringing a little terror and violence into the life of your stepdaughter. <laughs> how commendable it would be if you could get her to conform in your year of office. Well, I will certainly attempt it. Obstinate, though we both know her to be. No, she's only a woman, Lord Mayor, a mother of children. With all the powers we have in our hands, how can she withstand us? Quite so. I'll give the matter immediate consideration. Not consideration, Lord Mayor. I want immediate action. Whatever you wish, Your Grace. I would suggest this very Wednesday, the 9th. The 9th, it shall be. Let us first call her husband to account. You and your officers, Lord Mayor, can begin by informing him that he is ordered to appear before the Council of the North early on Wednesday. Yes, Your Grace. Then, while he's being questioned, your sheriffs and their men can do what you have overlooked these years, Lord Mayor. They can raid the house of Margaret Clitheroe and tear it apart if necessary. That will be done. And you know what I want you to find, Lord Mayor? I want you to find the right sort of evidence. Oh, my men will find all the evidence there is. But I want a special kind of evidence. Evidence that will hang her. Evidence that will hang her, my Lord Mayor. So they raided your house, Margaret. Yes. Father Mush was in his chamber in the secret place, so I dispatched one of my servants to warn him, and he escaped by way of my neighbour's house. But I believe they almost caught the schoolmaster, Mr Stapleton. Yes. 
Mr. Stapleton was quietly teaching when a ruffian bearing a sword and buckler on his arm opened the door. Suspecting Mr. Stapleton to be a priest, he shut the door on him and called to his fellows. I've got a priest in here! I've got a priest! Quick! But Mr. Stapleton made a quick exit by the other door and rushed upstairs to the room with the secret entrance to the mass chamber. He's getting away upstairs! After him, men! After him! Have it, James! He's locked the door on us! Break it down! It's solid! We need a battering ram! Smash the lock! Use your halberds on it! When they got inside, they found the room empty. Mr. Stapleton had thoughtfully closed the secret entrance behind him, so they thought he had escaped through the attic window. They then began to arrest everyone in the house, starting with me. Sheriff, there's a room full of children downstairs. A whole lot of them. And one boy, a Dutch lad, says he is. He looks frightened out of his wits. Any sign of the man? Nah, he got clean away. Who was he? Mrs. Clitheroe? Who was who? The man who must have jumped out of the window. I did not see any man jump out of any window. Take it away, and his <laughs> servants. I've never found an hiding hole yet. Neither have I. Didn't you just say there was a young forehead lad, frightened out of his wits? I just did. Well, tell them to bring him up here. Right. Sheriff wants that Dutch lad. Yeah, I saw three good bits. Can I take them, Sheriff? You said we could help ourselves after the raid. Not yet. The raid's not finished. The beds are mine. I don't want anyone else going off with them. Yes, well, all right, the beds are yours. But we've got to find some evidence of mass or priests. Not until we've got the evidence can you do those beds. Come here, you little rat. I know nothing. Please don't hurt me. Everybody knows something, lad. What's your name? Jan. Oh, Dutch, are you? I am part Dutch, part English. Part Dutch, part English, <laughs> eh? A bit of a mixture, eh? Take his clothes <laughs> off. No! <laughs> I haven't done anything! Oh, yes, you have. You have been caught in a papist house, lad. And that's enough. You, you bring a whip. A whip! Hey, where will I find it? You had no difficulty finding three beds, so find a whip. Please! I've done nothing. No, I've done nothing. <laughs> Only enough to get yourself hanged. Hanged? Oh, being Dutch, you don't seem to know the laws of England, lad. I, I, I know nothing. I'm sure you'll find you know quite a lot before we finish with you. Seen anybody hang, boy? No. Hmm. Well, you see, first you're drawn on a hurdle, head down, so that your head sometimes bangs on the road. And then when you get to the gallows, they put the rope round your neck mm. and you mount the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> then you give you speech. <laughs> the crowd always likes a speech. <laughs> what will you say, Len, lad? I don't know. <laughs> and at the right moment, the hangman takes you by the shoulder, twists and turns you up. <laughs> <laughs> Treason needs hanging, drawing and quartering. You cut down while you're still alive. Then you strip naked and cut... From belly to neck. <laughs> then your insides are pulled out before your eyes, and you can feel the executioner groping for your heart to pull that out. <laughs> I don't want to die. Uh, how about this one? It'll take the skin off him. Fine. Fine. You don't want to die, you say? No, no. Well, that's understandable. I suppose you'd like to escape a whipping, too. Now hold him down. Oh, I tell you, I tell you. I, I, I can show you the priest hidey hole. A priest hole? <laughs> not here, not in this house, lad. Yes, yes there is. Look, look here. Ah. Oh. This, this, is, this is the priest hole. Well, well. We never have found that by next Easter. You won't hang or whip me. Ah, you're a good lad. I'll not do anything to you now. It'll be a bit of a tight squeeze getting in there, so you lead the way then, eh? Very good. I show you. See anything, Sheriff? Aye. Aye, this is a priest hiding hole, all right. No priest, but besides a recent occupation, well, what's apple tarts, bread here. What about mass things? Well, what have you found now then, lad? Hidden cupboard. And it's full of vestments, books, linen, chalices, plates. Gold and silver too, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and if one item of this goes missing, 
It'll be your neck that's stretched. Now, this isn't spoil. This is the evidence that's going Gee. to put an end once and for all to Margaret Clitheroe. It's a pity about that lad, Mrs. Clitheroe. But for him, they'd have had nothing on you. Oh, it's getting dark. Time I lit the lantern. Ah, we'll have to do something about this bail. Jaya! Jaya! What is it? We want to empty a pail. Hey, Tesh, you're not still here. I said a few minutes, that was all. You've been here all day. Out with you. And drag that pail out with you at the same time. Oh. And not slop oh, it all over the floor. Margaret, God be with you. I'll try to see you again as soon as I can. Over oh, yes. my dead body. Out with you, woman. Pity oh. she has to go. Mrs. Clitheroe, there is a way you can save your life. A pregnant woman cannot be executed in England until after the birth of her child. Mm. Now, some of your friends and kinsfolks are saying you may be with child. You've only to say definitely that you are. The council have already questioned me on this matter, Mrs. Yard. The truth is I cannot tell for certain whether I am or not. I've been deceived before in this. And therefore, I cannot give a direct answer. But in your heart, how do you feel? I rather think I am with child than otherwise. And this I told the council. My lord, what brings you at this hour to a judge's chambers? It has come to my ears that you consider the prisoner Margaret Clitheroe is pregnant. That is so, my Lord President, and she may not be executed if she be with child. My good judge, you are too merciful in these cases. If she is not executed, she will undo a great many. If she be with child, I cannot consent that she shall die. And I am telling you that this woman is not to have the benefit of her belly. My Lord President, God forbid that she should die if she be with child. She may have offended, but the child in her womb has not. If she is suffered to live, there will be more of her order without any fear of law. Judgment is passed. Let the law proceed. I cannot give my consent until she is further tried. I am only asking you to stand by your judgment, my learned judge. If it helps you, I will take it upon my conscience that she is not with child. I will by no means consent. Whether you consent or not, my counsel will have its will in this matter. Well, then I refer it to your counsel, my lord. So unto you and them the decision rests. But I still have power to command a stay of execution. And this I do until Friday the 25th of March. Then depart this city with your conscience. She will have a stay of execution until Friday, March the 25th, my learned judge, but not a minute more. She shall die that very day. Margaret Clitheroe. Yes, Master Sheriff. We have come to inform you that your husband has been set at liberty and ordered to depart this city for five days. And what is the reason for this? So he will not be within the city when you are executed. Poor John. We are also come to you this night to inform you what day has been appointed for your death. And what day is that? Friday of this week. And this day is Tuesday, is it not? It is. There is not much time left to me. Sheriff, would it be possible for Mrs. Tesh to come to me now? We will tell her. Thank you, Master Sheriff. I would be most grateful for her company at this time. Agnes, I feel the frailty of mine own flesh which trembleth at this news. Although my spirit greatly rejoices. Therefore I ask again, Agnes, for God's sake, pray for me. I will, Margaret, I will. And I will ask everyone to pray for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Flesh is frail, but I trust in my Lord Jesu that he will give me strength to bear all troubles and torments which will be laid upon me for his sake. I hear my husband has been set at liberty and ordered to depart the city. 
When he was told of your condemnation, he fared like a man out of his wits and wept so vehemently that blood gushed out of his nose in great quantity. Oh, John. He told the councillors, Take all I have but save her, for she is the best wife in all England and the best Catholic also. Oh, how I love him, old John. Will he ever know? What of my daughter, Anne? How does she fare? Anne refused to betray you and is committed to prison where she is being extremely used because she refuses to renounce her faith. But she is constant. She is constant. Have no fear, Margaret. I can only you and God know how I worry about my husband and family. What can I do? There is only one thing you can do now. Cast away all fear and leave their welfare in the hands of God. That I do. I also make a voluntary and ready offering of myself to a cruel death in testimony of my love for God and the truth of my faith. You can do no more on this earth. There is one thing still to be done. And what is that? I wish to make myself a habit of linen, clean white, that will cover my body parts so that I shall not die naked, which causes me most concern. Leave it to me, Margaret. Needles, thread and linen will be yours to protect the dignity of womanhood. Miss Tesh, you will have to leave now. There is an important visitor to see you, Margaret Clitheroe. I wonder who that can be. I wonder. God be with you, Margaret. And with you, Agnes. It's the Lord Mayor himself. Father. As Lord Mayor of York, on my knees... I beg you to consider your husband and children, I beg you. There is no need to kneel. I wish no one to kneel before me, least of all the Lord Mayor of York. You mock me. Nay, I mock you not. You look neither dignified nor comfortable in such a position. <coughs> Margaret, great pressures were put upon me to act. This you must believe. I do believe. All I wished was the distinction of beginning my period of office as Lord Mayor by winning back my stepdaughter. I only wish to frighten you into conformity. Is that all? I even arranged the raid, knowing it would be too late to catch anyone at mass. I never thought anyone would give away the priest hole. I was... I was dismayed to see how things developed. Henry May? Dismayed? So was I. Then we have made light of things again, Margaret. The council can only see that sentence is carried out, a sentence so barbarous as to stir up public opinion still further against the council. But I don't doubt that yet I can get you a pardon. And how would you do that? By saying that you will conform, nothing else. A public denial of my beliefs, nothing less. Acquiescence to the new mood of the country would be a better way of putting it. Then you'd be able to live quietly and, and do what you wish. I'll see to it. And you will see to it that I could go to Mass and receive the sacraments while I live quietly. Oh, Margaret, you know that's impossible. I will not deny my beliefs, God willing. You do treasure your good name. I do. The, the Flemish boy. Oh, what now have they done to him? They've got him to confess that you have sinned with priests. Oh. And that the priests and you would have delicate cheer when you'd set your husband with bread and butter and red herrings. <laughs> you these forged tales. If the boy said so, I warrant you he will say much more for a pound of figs. Then think of John, your husband. How will he take these accusations? They'll cause him great hurt. They cause me even greater hurt. John will not accuse me that I have offended him at any time. You know the truth as well as anyone. Oh, truth to hell with truth. We have to save face, all of us. We have not to save our faces, but our souls, all of us, Father. I perceive nothing will serve to make you change your mind. Nothing. Well, once again, you show your stupidity. Jailer, let me out. Let me out of this woman's presence. Yes, Lord Mayor. All right. You are a sick and evilly disposed woman. You've brought yourself, your family... And the civil authority is a disrepute.
Mrs. Clitheroe. I was put in this cell to report your doings, but I've reported nothing. Thank you, Mrs. Yard. You're a very good woman, Margaret Clitheroe. Mrs. Yard, I would like you and some Catholics to accompany me and be with me when I die. At the time of my agony, put me in mind of God. Oh, I couldn't be present at so cruel a death, Mrs. Pithero. I, I just couldn't. But, but what I will do is procure some friend to lay on such heavy weight that you're put quickly out of your pain. Oh, no, good Mrs. Yower, not so. God forbid I should procure any to be guilty of my death and blood. I cannot see you die. I, I cannot for all the world, Mrs. Clitheroe. <laughs> the cell is dry now. We've had no rain these last few days. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> the sheriff will be coming for you at eight of the clock this morning, Mrs. Clitheroe. Eight this morning. God's will be done. Good morning, Master Sheriff. I have come for you, Margaret Clitheroe. Are you ready to die? I am ready. Is there anyone you would like to accompany you? Yes, Agnes Tesh. She's outside and waiting. Agnes Tesh! Yes, Sheriff? You can have a few moments together. Do you realise what day it is, Agnes? March the 25th, the Feast of the Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin. Mary, Mother of God, assist me in my last agony. She will. You've always had such a great devotion to Our Lady. It is remarkable that I'm able to offer up my soul on this particular day, which marks the moment that our Saviour was incarnate in the womb of the Blessed Virgin. If they had known, I'm sure they would have changed it. I believe they would. I do believe they would have chosen any but this day. This is the room in which you are to be executed. You may kneel down and pray first, Margaret Clitheroe. Thank you, Sheriff. I will do that. And while you're on your knees, you can pray for the Queen. I pray for the Catholic Church, for the Pope's Holiness, and for all such as have care of the souls. I pray for all Christian princes in the <laughs> world. Put out glorious Queen Elizabeth. I pray for Elizabeth, colony. Queen of England. And I humbly beseech God to turn her to the Catholic faith that after this mortal life she may enjoy the joys of heaven unto whose soul I do wish as much joy as unto mine own. Yeah, that's enough. Now, take off your clothes. Let her die in her clothes, Sheriff. What difference does it make? You keep out of this, Agnes Tesh. She must die naked as judgment was given against her. Please let me die in the smock. No, that I will not grant. Sentence is that you die naked. Then permit the women to unclothe me and have the men turn their faces from me. All right. You women, help her take things off. You men, turn your heads away. Go on. Is she ready yet? Yes. What's that thing she has on? It's just a habit of living to cover her secret parts. All the rest of her body is left naked. Surely you don't object to that. Yeah, all right. Lay her down upon the ground. Now, man. Put a sharp stone under her back. That's <laughs> it, that's it. Now you, cover her face with an handkerchief. Right. Now, lay this broad door on her. Don't put the waist on yet. Margaret Clitheroe, you cannot have your hands joined in front of your face. They must be tied to posts. You two, tie your hands to these posts. Look, she now forms the perfect cross with her arms extended. Get on with it. Margaret Clitheroe, before the weights are placed on the door, we have rested upon you. I call upon you again to ask the Queen's Majesty's forgiveness. And to pray for her. I have prayed for her. Then you are called on to ask your husband's forgiveness. If ever I have offended him, I do ask his forgiveness from the bottom of my heart. 
All right. Lay the weights on. Chase you, chase you, chase you. Have mercy on me. She was, in dying, one quarter of an hour. Upon her was laid to the quantity of seven or eight hundred weights at the least, which, breaking her ribs, caused them to burst forth of the skin. Her body was secretly buried in a dung heap the same night. Six weeks later it was found so pure and uncorrupted as though the soul had only departed from the body the day before. Margaret Clitheroe was canonized by Pope Paul VI at St. Peter's, Rome, on October the 25th, 1970. In Margaret Clitheroe by William Keenan, Elizabeth Proud played Margaret, John Clitheroe was Steve Hodson, Henry May, Stephen Thorne, the Earl of Huntingdon, Bill Wallace, Thomas Clitheroe, Jack Watson, and the judge, Peter Copley. The sheriff was Geoffrey Matthews, Father Mush, Patrick Malahide, Agnes Tesh, Angela Phillips, Mrs. Yard, Daphne Hurd, the jailer, James Cairncross, and the Earl of Northumberland, Geoffrey Bateman. Henry Clitheroe was Rupert Graves, Anne Clitheroe, Jilly Grattan, Jane, Miranda Forbes, Father Reeks, John Abineri, the woman in the crowd, Joe Anderson, and Jan Petrolia. The civil banqueting music was provided by the York Waits, and the Dies Irae was sung by the choir of Clifton Cathedral. Margaret Clitheroe was directed in Bristol by Sean McLaughlin. <laughs>